Hi, everybody. I am Sebastian. Uh, I'm going to give you a talk about some open data that you can use in your BrainHack school project. Um, and the idea of this is really more of me giving you an introduction rather than you necessarily following along. It has a little bit of a uh, tutorial flair, but I realize um, that we probably don't have the time for me to you know, make this so you can actually follow along and these slides will be posted and I think they're relatively clear uh, if you wanna come back to them later and, and do it for yourself. So with that said, my first slide actually says, please um, install something, which is not accurate, but I left it in there anyway, uh, because uh, it might be interesting to you. So <clears throat> as we'll see in a couple minutes, most of the data that we're going to look at are available in something called an Amazon bucket. And you will need to somehow get that data because it doesn't just have a download link. Uh, and if you're on Windows or Mac, there is this cool little duck faced tool called CyberDuck that you can use. It's a graphical interface that might be a bit easier. Um, and if you're in Linux or the other two also have this, um, there's a command line interface for AWS that you can download. Uh, I don't recommend that you do this right now unless you get very bored, but um, you know, the information is there just for you to uh, remember it. So um, why would you maybe not be very bored about this talk? Well, if you have any of these four questions and I hope to answer uh, them for you at least to some degree. So, the, they all sound very similar, but they're, they're a little bit different, right? So the first question you might have right now is where do I find data, right? Like other than somebody else that you know. Um, and how do I choose whether that's a good data set for, for a brain hack school project, which might be different. Some data sets are amazing, but you're not going to be doing something with them in two weeks. And then I already alluded to this, but unfortunately it's not as easy as just clicking a download link. So you need to figure out how to get it to your machine. And again, that could be a time constraint. And then lastly, I'll, I'll just touch a little bit on the question of how do you work with this? Actually, that's just one slide. Um, but yeah, if you have any of these questions and this is for you, if you don't, um, you know, you, you, might, you might find some other use for your time, maybe. Um, with that said, maybe it's still interesting. So let's get started. The first question, how do you choose a good data set? Um, well, the thing that you could ask yourself if you try to answer that is um, how easy do you, can you get access to it? Um, and I'll, I'll go over this in a second, just, just to, uh, to uh, correctly source my um, inspirations here. A lot of these slides are actually taken from a similar presentation by Chris Kovalevsky a couple of years ago. Um, so, Let's, let's just look at um, what ease of access might look like, right? So how easy is it to get access to your data? Well, like most things, this kind of lives on a spectrum and especially for larger clinical data sets, you would land relatively far on the left side where in order to get access to the data, you actually have to first sign a usage agreement. So that would be really hard to get access to. Um, and on the other extreme, you already have it downloaded on your little thumb drive or um, you know, uh, on your computer. So um, in between these things is where a lot of data lives that, that could be considered open. Um, some of them are on managed databases. And if you've used some of those, there, there are many different versions of these databases that call things like XNAT and uh, LORIS and lots of these the idea is always the same that you can you can enter search terms and they will in the end somehow make data available to you they're not always very easy to use so that could be a time constraint um and then more and more data are just released as basically amazon buckets so that just means the data is there and you can download it if you know how to and then you'll have it on your computer there aren't very many steps in between so for the purposes of a brain hack school, you should probably go with either something that you can get off of Amazon or, or one of these data buckets um, or that you already have. And um, 
the next question you might ask yourself is, well, how ready to go is this data, right? So if it's just fresh off the scanner, um, you're not going to be doing very much with this data set before you have organized it and pre-processed it. And on the other hand, if you're looking at data that has been already pre-processed or even analyzed, then um, it would be very easy to get started, but you obviously have less control over what you're doing. You A lot of the choices um, about the pre-processing and the analysis have already been made for you. And all of these data sets you, you, you can find somewhere, but um, again, it kind of comes down to something that you need to keep in mind when, when you choose what, what data set to go for for your Brain Hexable project. So just a little bit of an example of what this could look like if data comes off uh, the magnet, and I mean, you might be working on EG data, so this is slightly different, but the general principle is, is, is very similar. Um, so usually you have just unorganized, uh, or, or not unorganized, but idiosyncratically organized data. So depending on where, where this was acquired, um, you first need to do something with it to bring it into a standard format. So for imaging, that would be something like Nifty. So that's the step you need to do. And that's not a trivial step for everybody who's done that. And then once it's organized, hopefully in something like a bids or, or some standardized um, system, you need to pre-process it, which <clears throat> if you're talking about uh, imaging data or MRI data, um, there are several steps involved and there are pipelines that I think you might've heard uh, about last week or already know that can read this organized raw data and, and do these pre-processing steps. Uh, and again, if you've never done this, you should anticipate that this is a relatively involved step just in terms of learning what is necessary and how to uh, run these pipelines. They're very well maintained, most of them, but you still need to kind of learn their syntax and, and how do you run um, pre-processing on a large data set. Maybe you can't run that on your laptop. Maybe you need to use an external compute resource and so on. So once the data are pre-processed, um, you typically, that, that, that's probably what you want to look at. Um, that, that's, that's kind of what you're going for, but you still need to analyze them, right? So that's maybe where your project is oriented. You want to you wanna use uh, that as an opportunity to learn how to do that. Um, but this also takes some time. Um, and then in the, in the uh, I guess, most pre-processed or most processed case, you're just looking at derivatives of already pre-processed data that somebody else has generated. And I'll show you where you might find some of these and take those and do an analysis on top of them. Um, and so just as a little pointer, for the purposes of the BrainX school, you're probably best off somewhere in between pre-processed and derivative data um, in the interest of time. And the last question you might want to ask yourself um, if you're deliberating which data to go for is how useful is it to you? And there are a couple of things. I'm not going to go over them in too much detail here, but you, you, you can read all the points. The main idea is, um, is this data data that you can trust? So has somebody published a paper on it? That would be great. Or has somebody used it? That would also be great. Um, is this data that is useful in its content as it is available to you. So, you know, if you're interested in uh, addiction and you have a MRI data set where all the addiction information is not available to you for some reason, then it's, it's still a great data set, but just not right now. Um, so it's not very useful. And then the last one is data cost, which I urge you not to um, underestimate because some of these data sets, especially the ones that you read about a lot that are very attractive, um, can be excruciatingly large to the degree that the default method of obtaining them is getting uh, a hard drive shipped in the mail because downloading takes too long. So that's definitely not something you can do in, in a brain hack school. But then because of that size, um, pre-processing is also prohibitively expensive. It, it would just take weeks and weeks um, of, of uh, high performance cluster time to, to get this done. So, so again, maybe something for your PhD, maybe something for a collaborative project, probably not for um, a brain hack school. Okay, so some pointers for, for general ideas uh, on how to think about your data. And now the obvious question is, well, how do you actually find your data? Uh, and, and so 
there is a lot of different options and at the end of these slides i have i have some other links but for for our purposes i want to focus on these on these two um <clears throat> repositories and so uh maybe a little bit of history here uh fcp indie is 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 an old um or is maybe one of the first uh, projects for for open data sharing in the in the imaging community is called the 1000 functional connectomes project and what what the group around this has done is really uh, pretty amazing if you uh, if you open their website you land on uh, on this thing that doesn't look too too clear at first but but every button you click here you can go and and see data sets right and these have been all shared by the um by the people who have acquired them and they have, they're usually in uh they're, they're well documented and this is a great resource and a, a lot of the things that you don't even might think are, are associated with uh with these fcom 1000 projects um live under their larger umbrella i'll show you some some specialized data sets at the end and then um a relatively a uh, newer project is Open Neuro, which is an amazing database uh, that just has openly shared data. Um, and I'll I'll have a little bit of a uh, explanation for you in a second on how to get this data. But the, the great thing about these is, first of all, there are many, um, and they're usually very well documented. So that's something, unfortunately, that's not always true of, uh, of the FCOM 1000 data, just because they're, you know, Oftentimes, it was just asking uh, some investigators to share their data, and, and it hasn't been such a streamlined and standardized process in the past necessarily. But these data on Open Neuro are um, generally already in bits format, which is amazing for you. And again, we'll go over how to uh, how to use those resources in a second. Okay, so I think. If, if you're going for imaging, uh, even EEG, uh, Open Neuro will have a lot of um, a lot of uh, opportunities for you. Um, so I went over these two. This will happen a couple of times actually, because sometimes I'll just jump out of the slides here, but keep them in so you can you know check them later. Um, and there's some other uh, cool platforms. So the the uh, Confi portal uh, was recently started and is growing, as you can see by this uh, helpful um, figure there. And um, Compi is uh, focusing on um, different types of data. So most of the data you will find on FCOM 1000 and on uh, Open Neuro are raw data. So you need to still pre-process them. Um, and as I've just said, that might actually not be feasible for you, especially if you've never done this or you don't know, you're not collaborating with somebody who, who has done this in the past. Um, so Compi has a number of, or I think actually at this point, it's just one pre-processed data set. Um, but, but they also have a lot of derivative data and, and this might be something that, that could be interesting for you uh, to look into. I'm, I'm not gonna use it in my examples, but I'll, I'll keep in the slides. And then <clears throat> there's this, now it's already a bit older. It hasn't been updated, but there are num uh, it's just a like a, a GitHub document that has a lot of different data sets um, described there that you you know might might be interested in. Just links for it um, to go out. So if you don't find anything anywhere, give it a look. Maybe maybe something in there is interesting to you. Um, and then lastly, you've already used Nylon, I think, in the tutorials last week. And Nylearn does have a number of um, data sets. They don't live in Nylearn. So these are data sets that would live on the uh, FCP Indie or um, maybe an Open Neuro, but Nylearn has built around some of them a little data grabber. And so it's really, really easy to get these data sets. But um, I think in terms of pre-processed data, they just have two data sets um, that are not the newest. And, and the idea here is more um, for, you know, testing or for you to have quick access to data rather than um, this being the main way that you, you get the, those, those data sets. Okay, so a couple ideas where you can look for them, but now you might wonder how do you actually get it, right? 
Um, and again, you have a little bit of a spectrum here um, and you will just have to figure out basically which hat you want to wear these the, um, today. I'm uh, going for an analogy here, bear with me. Uh, so as I just said, if, if, if you just want to try something out, if, you, if you're trying to learn a new um, machine learning algorithm and you need some data, uh, so the, the Nylearn data grabbers are perfect for that, very quick. Um, if you want to get your data in a uh, ideally very unobtrusive way, uh, rather than stepping through through um, some, some complicated uh, database that I haven't even shown you at this point, uh, you, might, you might just go for an Amazon bucket. And Amazon buckets, uh, I'll, I'll show you in a second how to use them, are really straightforward. You just point to where it is and say, I want this, and then it gets downloaded to your, to your device. And then there's a third thing that you should keep in mind very strongly, and I'm not going to explain it to you today, um, which is Datalad. And Datalad is, if, if you've ever used version control for your code, um, and you, you understand the, the principle behind it so that each file has a complete history of what happened to it. Data Lad does that for your data. Um, and Data Lad is also a way to get data sets, which is really cool because then not only do you have the data, you have a lot of meta information. And if you change something to it, it gets updated. It's, it's a great tool, a bit much to explain um, in the scope of this uh, tutorial but I'll have a link later on for you. Okay, so again, where do you put your hat? Um, well, I guess somewhere in between here and there. Uh, so between Nylon and, and Amazon. And um, I don't really know why Amazon um, S3 is called buckets. I think it's, it's either some kind of inside computer science joke or just, if you know, let me know. I, I just find it very funny that it's called a bucket. So I wanted to put the bucket in there. Uh, and it does behave like a bucket, by the way. Uh, if, you know, if you get into that, it, it, it's not like a, like a classical file system that you can step through very easily. Okay, so let's try that out. Um, so if, if, if you decide that today you just want a quick tutorial data set from Nylearn, um, what do you need to do? Well, you need to figure out what Nylearn has to offer. You need to choose one of them um, and then download it and then do something with it. Okay, so um, Nylearn has uh, a great documentation and that should always be your first step. If you have any questions about anything, read the documentation. And if that doesn't help, then read Stack Overflow. Um, and then if that doesn't help, then, well, I guess we need to figure out something else. But so the documentation, it covers most of your problems in Nylearn, I would, I would say, and, and, and here, uh, you, you have uh, all of the data that you can get. Um, now, most of those aren't actually data sets in the, in the sense that I've been talking about them. Most of them are atlases, uh, which are, you know, ways to parcelate the brain. Um, that reminds me, I have to add one of these. And, uh, well, but, but we have two, I don't know, where did they go? Right here. No, that's, oh yeah, that's, that's, I think, okay, yeah, that's, that's the abide pre, um, pre process connect on project or something like it's PCP. So that's a data set. Um, and then there's also ADHD, which is um, the ADHD SSA data set. Okay, so let's, let's assume you're interested in ADHD and you want to get the ADHD data set or at least one of these subjects. Well, you're in luck. It's very easy. Um, I've actually prepared something for you. And again, you don't necessarily need to follow along here, but um, I'll, I'll click on this link and then you'll have it later. That, that's kind of the idea. So um, this is something, I don't know if you've, uh, if, if you've checked this out uh, in the past, but if, if you have a, if you're working with notebooks, um, with Jupyter notebooks, and you put them on GitHub, you just need to add one little file and now you can share your notebooks with other people and they can run them uh, on the internet if it starts. If it doesn't, we have the, the slides ready. I should probably have started this before I clicked on the link. Um, 
well, you know, let's just go with the slides and see if it launches in the end. But, but this is a really cool way of, of sharing things with other people so they can actually use it rather than just look at what you've done. But um, I'm just gonna show you the syntax here very quickly. So what we do up here is we import from Nylearn a bunch of things. Um, for now, we only need the data set. And then what we say is data set fet, fetch ADHD and, oh yeah, here we go. I don't know why this didn't launch directly. So, okay, so I'm importing these things and I say data set fetch ADHD and because I don't wanna stress the network so much, I say just get me one subject. I do that and it says I'm downloading things and it's almost done. Boom, there it's done. And then, so if, if you work with Python, what you get here um, is, is, a, is a dictionary. So you have some keys in there. And if you look inside the keys, um, so data, and then let's say phenotypic, you can see that there is uh, a byte string formatted uh, comma separated file. So that's probably one of the best way to look at this. But if we look at the description of the data set, then we can see, oh yeah, there is a nice description of the data set, that's great. And then if you look at func, it tells us where the functional data ended up. So this is currently somewhere on the on the server of, of Binder, um, but I can still load it. Um, so now I have I have the image loaded um, with, with a library called MyBabel that you might know, and I can plot it. That takes a little second. Yeah, and there it is. And now I can do stuff with it. And that's as easy as that. I just had couple lines of code and now I have the data accessible to me. And if I want to know about the pre-processing information or the confounds, uh, because what I loaded is a functional data set. So I have time series information, I have confound information. It's all in there. I can, I can get started right away. And this is, this is great. But as I said, um, you, whoops, you currently only have, uh, as far as I know, two ready to go data sets here. Um, and you know, this is more for testing things out. But I wanted to show it to you because maybe that's just what you need to get started. Okay, so we've done all of these things. Now let's look at an Amazon example. So Amazon S3, as I told you, is, is what I would say the vast majority of uh, data repositories use um, to, to give you their data these days. I mean, it's not true for all of them, but it's it's quite frequent now. And that's just because of how easy it is. So how do you do that? Well, let's say um, you're interested in data from Open Neuro, which I think would be a good idea to be interested in data from Open Neuro. Um, and so you go on that website. Again, I'm just gonna go and show you and then you, you have the slides for later. Um, so you click on it and you say, okay, I want a data set um, and because I tricked, uh, tried this out yesterday, I want something about traumatic brain injury because that is a really small data set. That's very, very nice for me. Um, but if, if you were interested in autism, uh, well, actually, I find that their search for some reason sometimes is a bit odd. They have a lot of data sets, but the search doesn't doesn't work fantastically, but let's, let's, just, let's just go with a traumatic brain injury. Okay. Famous last words. So um, here you have a data set and I already showed you this a little bit before. Um, it's relatively well documented. So you can, you can, you can have, you have some information here. Um, you know who the authors are. You can even look at the funding sources. Often if it's data that belongs to a certain paper, uh, oh yeah, it, I, whoops, uh, yeah, I'm, I'll check that later. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Oh, Pierre just told me that there is interesting data that you might have access to. We, we can check that in a second. Um, and then up here, what you see is um, the bits validator. So. It says check this and it says valid. Sometimes it's orange and says there are some issues with it, which shouldn't be a big problem. It just tells you what's not 100% bits conform. And here you can see the data that's in there because it's so tiny, it's only two subjects, um, but I can already look at it. Now, I don't know if you need to do that, but it's really cool that you can. 
Um, and so here you go. That's one uh, anatomic brain scan of a person. Um, and well, you might say, okay, this sounds like a good data set. I want to have that. So you click on the download link and it's almost, oh, I didn't know that you could actually download with your browser now. Okay, well, so maybe, maybe I wasn't entirely correct. There is a download button and you could click it, but I would still recommend that you don't do that and rather go with the uh, Amazon S3 client or the command line client. So I'm not gonna show you because I'm on Linux, I'm not gonna show you the cyber ducky, um, but I have it described in the slides. It's very easy. Uh, if you just want to see what's in here, what you can do is you go, um, where do you go? Yeah. Go here and then you say AWS uh, S3 because it's an S3 bucket. And now all you need is this address, which is basically, um, it's 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 a it's a path on the S3 file system in a way you know you can think about it that way, um, but we don't want to download it. We just want to look inside. So I'll just add ls in front here, um, rather than what they give you as a download link is sync and sync downloads it, which we can also do. It's not that big, but I just wanted to show you. Uh, and then the last thing you need uh, is no sign request, which is um, a lot of letters for, I don't want to give a password, I log in anonymously, which you often do if your data is uh, openly accessible, right? You don't need to show your credentials first. So if I do that, it um, takes a little bit of time. And for some reason, he didn't want to show me. Huh. Okay, I'm confused now. Well, you know what? Maybe let's just do what they tell me here and see what happens. Um, so now, rather than LS, I say sync. And um, I'm asking them now to download the 40 megabytes of data to my machine. And here we have, okay, I have, um, run into a demonstration problem. Well, okay, just trust me that generally, if you do this, um, that doesn't happen. Uh, I believe what might be going on here is that it's using git annex, something like a bit in the data lab direction. I don't know. Usually it shows you the data that's available if you do ls, and if you do sync, it actually gets the data as you would expect. Um, if you use the cyberduck program, then you actually um, have a bit more of a graphical interface. It looks a bit like this. Uh, so this, this might be more intuitive for you. But yeah, this is what it normally looks like if you do this LS, right? Um, and this is a different data set. Uh, right, so at the end of this process, you now have either all the data and, and oh yeah, sorry, what I wanted to say is you, you can choose not to download the whole data set, right? So you can just keep adding to this path here. Uh, for example, you can say, oh, well, I don't really care about your um, uh, raw data, just give me the derivatives. And so you add derivatives here uh, and then just sync that. Um, but whichever way, at the end of this process, you have the data on your machine. Uh, there's a question from Emily. Does CyberDark work only on Linux? No, it's the opposite. It works not on Linux. It works only on Windows or on Mac. Um, and unfortunately, that's most often the case with cool little tools that are visual. Yeah, so that's why I put the CLI in there. Also, if you prefer the command line, you know, you can use the command line you can use on all systems. Okay, so now you have your data. Uh, what do you do with it? And I'm not going to go into too much detail here. Just a couple general uh, points. So the first thing you should do with the data is you should respect it. Um, sharing data is really important and um, you know it takes a lot of time. Uh, and so the people who have agreed to share the data of them, I mean, there's a research side who, you know, they do all the work, but there are some people who come in and they get scanned and they say, yeah, you know, in the interest of research, please use my data. You should respect these people. I mean, you're also legally obliged to do that, but you know, 
that's that should be your first priority um so follow the data usage agreements follow every confidentiality agreement if you work with clinical data again that's a legal requirement i'm just pointing it out um but you should also cite the people who have created this data set because that is again a lot of work and hopefully uh with time this will become something that is seen as a very important contribution it is already the case in in some communities like ours but you know there's still some some work needed here right so so lift up the people who share the data um and then the next thing you want to do is you want to document what you do and this is something that you do both in the interest of reproducible research but mostly in the interest of yourself um so and again, I'm going to point to data lab here because that's kind of where data lab comes in and, and hold your hand holds your hand. It, it's a bit of a setup work to get it running, but um, You won't forget what you've done to your data. If you use data lab. But let's assume that for some reason you don't um, Document everything. Just just assume that in one year you come back to your data set and you have completely forgotten every single thing about it. Uh, so write down where you got it from, um, save all your scripts, obviously, but also uh, ideally what you do is you have a, a link to your data and from the raw data, you have a continuous line of processing scripts that get you to your pre-processed data and your analysis. Um, and, and just write down what you've done for yourself along uh, the process. And uh, lastly, you should you should organize your project. And I, I actually had a question about that yesterday. Um, what that means is how you store everything that comes after the pre-processing and the analysis is really important as well. So luckily, we, we now have these great initiatives like BIDS to um, make standards for how data are organized when they're raw or to some extent now also when they're pre-processed. But you want to keep a really tight uh, structure for your own project um, for, the again, the reason of, of being able to share it, reproducibility, just keeping a clear, uh, you know, view of what you're doing. If, if in the end you have, you have 50 analysis folders that all have like months in there and like little um, substrings that are supposed to, to show different analysis uh, directions, that doesn't help you at all. You will regret this very quickly. Um, and some of the things that you can do to make this easier is to use the tool that you've learned last week, um, especially version control for your code, uh, virtualization for your processing environment, which is fantastic. Uh, if something breaks just before your deadline, you will be very sad. But if you have a virtualization environment, you will probably be fine rather than, oh, I updated Windows and now all my analysis scripts have died. Um, that would be sad. Yeah, and you will be very happy about this um, later. And this is the kind of time investment that at first seems a bit overkill. And later on, you will be so glad that you did uh, and understand why. Or I guess you learned the hard way, which is also possible. Uh, okay, so let's say, you know, 50 minutes left. Great. Um, you want more data? Sure. I'll, I'll show you some other links, um, but that was kind of the, the core of what I, what I wanted to present to you. Um, there are more databases out there, and, and the reason I didn't focus on them at first is there aren't necessarily as field specific, right? So we, we're all kind of doing something with neural uh, neuroscience, but, but these are more general uh, research oriented data repositories, and um, you might find very cool data there and you should go and look for it. Uh, so Zenodo is, is a really cool um, uh, website that you could also think about when your data is ready and you've an analyzed it and you want to share it. Um, gives you a digital uh, object identifier. There's all these little DOI links that you often see uh, associated with papers. And that's really nice because um, that thing is very consistent so you can share it and it will work later on, people take care of that. Uh, it's also hosted at the CERN, so that's, that's cool. And um, picture, I'm not gonna go over all of them. What, one thing I wanna point out, because I don't think that's known very well, is um, Google has a dataset uh, search engine now, um, which is 
what Chris Gorgulevsky is working on, the guy that uh, I took some free inspiration for the slides from. Um, and check out all of these is what I want to say. Uh, if you say you want pre-processed data, uh, I don't know of very many publicly shared pre-processed data sets. Um, if you know more of them, please share that information. Um, there is the pre-processed connectums project on the uh, fMRI side, so that's more what, I, what I'm aware of. Uh, both of these come out of the um, FCP in the, in the environment. Oh, and actually now, now would be a good time for, for what Pierre said. Yeah, exactly, the developmental data set. Um, da, 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 can be fetched very easily. Okay, okay, okay. So I don't know if that's pre-processed, but you know, that's another data set and you can get that from that learn. Um, but uh, Open Neuro has some pre-processed data sets. I've seen on Conp, there is one from Elizabeth. Um, maybe maybe it, it makes sense um, if you're part of a team or, or a lab um, to see whether, whether uh, you know, you, you have pre-processed data uh, available. Again, I don't know if in the interest of, uh, yeah, yeah, so human connection project, I'm gonna come to those. I, See, this is, this is, this is exactly um, a very good point. What about the human connectome project uh, Liz has asked? Um, it's a great data set and uh, I will bet you some money that you won't be able to use it in the brain hack school because of how big it is. But, but maybe I'm wrong and maybe, um, maybe, maybe that's, that's um, cool. The only thing is it is, also something that you need to go through an approval process, even though I think, look, I don't remember how complicated the approval process is, but, but it's not open in that sense. It's, it's open in the sense that, that you can get it, but you need to go through some, some uh, data usage agreements. Uh, I have a, lot, uh, a, a number of these uh, cool big data sets at the end of the slide. Uh, some other data sets that I want to point out that are really interesting, and in, uh, if you're interested in, in reproducibility, are uh, longitudinal or repeated scanning um, data sets, and there are a number of these. So the, the Child Mind Institute um, has this uh, Healthy Brain Network serial scanning. I always forget what the name is, but, but it's a really cool data set, um, and you can get it. Again, here's a link. If you click on it and you go to how do I download the data, uh, you end up with an AWS storage, right? And, oh, they're actually, yeah, they're using CyberDuck. There you go. This is what CyberDuck looks like on Mac. Um, that's how you get this data set. Um, and they're, yeah. Uh, right, so Pierre, Pierre just answered another thing about the HCP. Um, it, it, it can definitely be de defeasible. Just keep in mind, you know, HTTP is a very big data set and, and so on. If, if, if you think this is interesting to you, by all means, go for it. Um, yeah, so I'm not gonna go into all of them. One thing I wanna point out though, again, another one that lives under the FCP uh, umbrella and I find is a, is a really cool resource is the um, Consortium for Reproducible Research. And that is a um, website, whoops, where'd they go? Some instructions, no. Hmm. Oh wait, sorry, I, I clicked on the wrong thing here. Yeah, I actually put the wrong link. Huh. Look at that. Um, so this is what I was talking about. Um, there are lots and lots of data sets here that are um, that include longitudinal data that you could use for uh, reproducibility uh, research. So that could also be really interesting. And then you have some other data sets uh, of individual people that have been scanned several times. Um, if you wanted to go for derivative data, so now this is data that somebody has already processed. Um, a good starting point is NeuroVault. Uh, actually, I, I've been using this recently. Um, I'm just gonna show you this very briefly. Like I was reading a paper and the authors um, did not share their data. And, uh, but somehow their data ended up on NeuroVault. And that was very helpful to me because now I can look at their statistical maps and download them and then do, 
you know, my own analysis with them. And, and here you can see they have a, a number of contrasts. Um, I can scroll through them, I can download them. This is a really cool website that um, asks you when you're done with your analysis to uh, upload your, you know, your statistical maps. Your, like the big term is derivatives here. You derive this from your pre-process data. Neurosynth is another cool website um, for, for peak activation maps. Unfortunately, it seems like it's down for some reason. Um, I think that's hopefully transient, but I've, I've tried it before the talk and it didn't work. Um, and, and there are a number of other things like um, Balsa and so on, but yeah, derivative data. Now, uh, if for some reason the documentation doesn't help you, one thing I would point you to is the website called Neurostars, which is a forum where a lot of the people who live in the wider bids um, fMRI prep environment hang out, but it's, it's, a, it's a general purpose forum and it, it's a great way to ask uh, questions that are more general, I guess. If, if you have a specific question, excuse me, about a scientific project or something like that, it has, has a Git repository, you've now figured out how to do Git issues. That's usually a good way um, to make somebody aware of, of a problem you've encountered or found. It, it's not really for, for support in the sense that you don't understand how to do it, but if, if something breaks, um, GitHub issues are great. If you don't understand how something works, Neurostars is great. You know, this is just like asking people across the table. And then Mattermost um, is the, the brain hack as a whole environment. And um, you're at the brain hack school and there's a Slack channel for that school. But if you're done with this, and I'm sure somebody's already shared this with you, there's a Mattermost, which is like the open source Slack uh, brain hack channel that you could, you could join. Okay, and then now we're with the data that everybody is very excited about, but you know, I'm, I'm trying to encourage you to think about this more as a, as a big project data set. Um, there are a number of them, that's, that's not all of them, um, but, but the big ones are obviously the Human Connection Project, uh, the UK Biobank, um, Allen Brain Institute has a number of really cool data sets. And, and you might be interested in looking into these. And yeah, that's the end of my talk. I would encourage you to share your own data um, because if you do that, cool things can happen. Um, and I hope you have some idea of uh, where to find and how to download data sets for your brain hack school project. Cool. Do you have any questions? We have six minutes. Um, no questions. I'm just checking the, 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 the chat. Uh, <clears throat> oh, EG, yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, I'm not super familiar with EG, so I know that there are some EG data sets on Open Neuro. Um, whoops. So yeah, there's going to be a, a talk tomorrow by uh, Karim Gerbi. He's going to give a, an intro to uh, electroencephalography, magnetoencephalography. Uh, he, he'll likely have some, some more mind pointers too. Yeah. Well, there, there are some here, yeah. Yeah, exactly. That, that might be, I might not be the right person to answer that for you. Um, uh, unfortunately, I have managed to close chat uh, yeah sorry so i don't really see your question asking anymore. if uh, i want to get data that is behavioral and fmri together yeah so uh that's kind of what i was referring to with the usability most data um sets have metadata right so th there's not only the um uh there's not only the uh imaging data, but there's also the metadata that might include phenotypic information, um, you know, about the participants in your data set, how old are they, um, what is their clinical status. If, if you look at fMRI task data, then the task design would also be part of that. I don't know exactly if that's what you mean by fMRI, but most data sets would come with this additional metadata, and that typically is what makes the data set interesting. You could have a 70 
super uh, sequence uh, fMRI data set that's completely useless because you don't have any metadata. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Nylon, no. Nylon, I don't think Nylon sees its role as making all the data available. They want to make certain data sets that are useful uh, for prototyping available very quickly. Uh, data Lad has an interface for all the open neural data sets. And um, if you, I don't know if, I think Pear at some point mentioned that he has, um, he has a deck of slides about data lab, but you know, um, there is a very detailed documentation about how, how to use data lab. So if, you know, if, if there's something that interests you, um, you can definitely, you can definitely take a look. Uh, has anyone tried Mendeley data? That is interesting. I do not know about Mendeley data. My first thought would be Mendeley is owned by Elsevier and Elsevier is not the name I would associate the most with open sharing of data. So my recommendation would be check this very carefully. And if you want to share data openly, it's good to use the resources that work. Um, so Open Neuro has a lot of um, a lot of punch behind it, uh, and and it works really well. Uh, so Zenodo, Figshare, they're not gonna die immediately. Um, I I don't know about Mendeley data. I'm, I I would be curious how what what their terms are and how persistent and open and free. Uh, that is. Yeah, thanks for the, for the link so, here. Yeah, I just wanted to, to add that uh, Tatalad that, that uh, has this pretty cool feature, which is also something you can do in Git. Like when you have a project, you can uh, insert it into another project. Those are called the submodules. So when you start a Git <coughs> repo and you want to use another Git repo inside of it, uh, one of your options is just add it as a submodule. Except that Datalad not only uh, controls versions of, of, of code, it also works for data. So um, you can create those like super data set that aggregate basically all the Datalad data sets out there. So the Datalad people have done that. I've, I've, I've pasted the link. They say it's roughly 10 terabytes of data at, at the moment. It includes Open Neuro uh, amongst uh, other things. It has a byte, a byte two, a DLG 200 in there. So it gives you basically a command line interface to, to download like a bunch of data set, including version control. So that's pretty, pretty cool. And uh, CUNP, for those who've heard about this initiative, the Canadian Open Neuroscience Platform, uh, one of their initiatives led by JB Pauline uh, is, is to do this kind of super data set in Canada and also accommodate data set that are, uh, have uh, data usage agreements. So things like the UK Biobank, for example, that uh, the, the super data set of, of data lab is only for public ones. But uh, CONP is trying to also uh, list ones that are not public. Just, you know, you, you, you see the list of files, but to actually download the files, you need to have your, your data use agreement, which I think is a very elegant solution to accommodate data sets that are completely free but also data sets that have maybe like a lot of, 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 uh, of um, confidential data in them and actually require some kind of, uh, of an access policy uh, as well, because you know, so lots of resources will still require those and probably likely will require those in the future uh, moving forward as well. <clears throat> 